morning, everybody, and welcome. Borida Ichigid, Croisamar Ichi, Etsa, at in session Ross Brequas Borama, Croisamar, my brave young Kalakum Ichigid Borama. Uh, a very warm welcome to you this morning. My name is John Parry Jones, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our breakfast briefing this morning. A special briefing in many respects, the biggest audience we've had here in the suite since pre COVID. So uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces here. Welcome back. <clears throat> um, when Wales qualified for the uh, World Cup back in June, Sarah Lethbridge and I sat down and thought that we ought to try and contrive a breakfast brief briefing that in some way reflected the enormity of what the country had achieved. Um, but no, uh, in my wildest dreams, hadn't thought that we might be able to welcome this morning uh, the CEO of the Football Association of Wales. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be able to welcome Noel Mooney to be with us this morning. Noel, your diary at the moment must be absolutely chock-a-block, so we're really grateful that you've been able to spare us the time this morning. Um, it would also be remiss of me to overlook the fact that Laura McAllister is with us as well. This morning wouldn't have happened without Laura's support, and I'm sure your diary is as busy as Noel's as well. So thank you both for making the time to be with us this morning. <clears throat> Now, before I hand over, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to a few events that we've got coming up over the course of the next month. Um, firstly, on uh, the 29th of November, Sarah Lethbridge is with us to run a, Sarah, uh, a service design training course. Um, a course, a, a program, a day-long program that will look at uh, helping you examine your current service uh, offering and understand exactly where and how you could improve on that. Uh, if you're in a customer facing environment, if you have customers, then this may be the course for you to uh, help you identify customer needs, their own motivations and how you can um, design a, a program that is specifically um, a, a, a tailored for your customers demands. It'll help you identify those needs that uh, that your customers may need. So if you've got any interest in that, do get in touch. Uh, the registration page is open at the moment or get in touch with Sarah or with me. And we'll be happy to give you further details. Uh, on the 6th of December, we have an emotional intelligence workshop, a two-hour session with um, Dr. Artyom Klitschnikov. Uh, again, helping you to identify and refine some of your people skills um, so that you can become a better manager. It may apply to you. It may apply to some of your teams. Um, but uh, a course that will help you identify your own emotions and how you can use those emotions to your best advantage. Um, free of charge session. It's just a two hour session. So again, keep your eye out for uh, the details as they come through over the course of the next few days. And then our next breakfast briefing, the December breakfast briefing is on the 13th of December. Uh, and it asks the intriguing question, what does it take to be a 21st century public servant? We're going to be joined by Paul Matthews, who's the CEO of Monmouthshire County Council, and also Lisa Knight Davis, Davis and Owen Wills, also from uh, Monmouthshire Council. Um, and they're going to look to see how they have prepared themselves, how they are trying to equip themselves for life in the uh, 21st century, um, where they are now, where we are now, where we might want to be, how we're going to get there um, and what we'll what we'll what we will know, how we will know that we've achieved the aims that we're looking to achieve. It's going to be a really thought provoking session. So keep your eyes out. The, um, the, the registration page will be uh, open in a day or two. As always, if you or your organizations have any bespoke training needs, please do get hold of Sarah or of me. We have huge amounts of resources here in the business school. We can help build a program that is tailored for your needs. Um, whatever those requirements may be, short or long, do get in touch with Sarah or with me. We're quite happy to, to sit down and try and build a program that will suit your needs. And on the same lines, uh, we're still have our Help to Grow program, which is ongoing. Help to Grow, uh, in case you don't know, is a program designed for SMEs. It's a 12-week intensive program uh, which involves academic teaching here in the business school, but also the opportunity to work with your peers. There, there will be up to 20 people on the same program at the same time. Uh, an opportunity to work with peers and with mentors as well. Really popular course, um, really good opportunity um, to, to work with uh, peer groups and with some of the academics here. So again, if you're interested in that, please do get hold of me or contact Linda on the email address, which is there in front of you. Now, on that note, I'm going to hand over to Laura for the next hour or so. Just a reminder that this morning's event is being recorded. <clears throat> um, and in terms of Q&A, we want to make this an interactive session. Session. I know that Laura is keen to, to involve the audience as much as we possibly can. If you're online uh, and you have any questions this morning, 
please pop your questions into the chat box and Angharad will um, respond to those uh, questions and pose them on your behalf. It may be that if you're online, you just want to use the chat box to pass on some good wishes to Noel and the Welsh team. Feel free to do that if you just want to pop in Public Cymru or something along those lines. If you're here in the audience with us in the suite this morning, uh, as soon as we get around to the Q&A session, if you just raise your hand, then Laura will try and pick and choose uh, and, and enable you to ask your question. Please do wait until we bring you a microphone, though, so that the people at home are able to hear the question that you uh, ask. But on that note, Laura, I'm going to leave it with you, if that's okay, for the next hour or so. Thank you again. Diolch lawr iawn, John. Um, Croeso Pawb, very warm welcome to you all. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be hosting um, this In Conversation with Noel. Um, I feel like I've known Noel for a very long time, but that's probably just because we've spent so much time together over the past two years. Originally, we met in UEFA circles, Noel, didn't you, when I was contesting an election for a place on FIFA Council, which I didn't win, by the way. Um, but Noel was very helpful to me in the convention and talked to me about what it took to win the votes of the 55 UEFA member associations. Um, and then, of course, since then, we've been very fortunate in recruiting Noel to the position of chief executive at the Football Association of Wales. Um, let's, just, let's just start with that, Noel. What, what's a boy from Limerick doing in Wales and why did you leave? I mean, I'm off to UEFA this afternoon. Why did you leave that lovely office on the, on the shores of Lake Geneva to come and work in Wales, which we know is equally beautiful, but at that point hadn't qualified for a World Cup. We knew we had more work to do to generate a successful, sustainable association. So what attracted you, you to Cymru? I get obsessed with learning Cymraeg at the moment. So. <laughs> I am the uh, Is it still off? Okay. Um, so, first of all, Laura's been very disingenuous. She did an unbelievable um, against an Italian. Italy's a superpower of uh, world football. And Laura, in the work that she did in that campaign, you came really close. Uh, and I've no doubt that we'll see you at the very highest levels of world football. Uh, very soon. So very lucky to have you, Lauren. It's always a, a huge pleasure to, to meet you and to be mentored by you and how to develop world football, which is very important. So first of all, um, I had, um, you know, as you know, I grew up in the West of Ireland. Uh, football was one of four sports, really, because we had hurling and Gaelic football, which were the two biggest where I was from. Uh, rugby was growing uh, and there was football. And um, I suppose growing up in my early years in London, going back to the West of Ireland, in our school, you weren't allowed to play football. It was it was part of the the legacy of the ban, I suppose, back in the seventies and that. So I was quite defensive because I loved football. You know, I wanted to build my own football club, which I did when I was twelve in my village, which is still going strong. And I had this great love of football itself, but also I suppose how to administer the sport, how to grow the sport, how to market the sport. Even when I went on to become a player, um, I was really interested in crowds and you know the business of the sport and building stadiums and building infrastructure and community engagement. I was almost more interested in that than actual football itself. So that was a journey as a player. But when my football career ended, um, the FAI had a job, the longest title in the world. It was National Coordinator of the Club Promotion Officer Programme. Um, mm -hmm. But I was lucky to get that job. I was late 20s. And I knew the instant I walked in the door, I said, this is home because this is football. This is a marriage between. And if there's any career guidance teachers, I would say, if you can do what you love and get paid to do what you love, I mean, for me, it's never work. It's just it's pure joy, really. Um, so I knew instantly that football and business and the business of football was perfect. So I started in the FBI. I knew within weeks that this was going to be my life. Um, and we built the FBI very well, actually, um, over a number of years. Um, and then UEFA saw me um, speaking at different conferences and presenting things. And they asked me to go and help in different countries, Israel, Kazakhstan, and different countries. I found myself helping with their strategy and building different ideas. And then they asked me to write a paper on how would I grow European football. And I remember one weekend going home, locking the door and just writing for the whole weekend, how would I grow European football? And I sent it to the general secretary back then. Um, and within a week or two, they'd asked me, would I deliver that? That was it. There was no interview. It was just, here's the paper. Here's my view for European football. Would you deliver that? And that was in um, 2011. So then I did 10 years um, leading on strategic development for UEFA, which was perfect for me because you're right at the heart of European football. You were dealing with the biggest clubs, the biggest national associations in the world. And my job was literally a blank sheet of paper. It was, you know, go and help Germany with their digital strategy, help Spain with their overall strategy, help Italy with something else, help Liechtenstein build from the ground up. 
and it was great because you know whatever ability I had, I was exposed to the best people in the world, what they were doing. So say it was, I don't know, digital transformation. I had the ability to go and find the best person in Europe, certainly in digital transformation, or bring them from the states, wherever they were, to work through what does a digital transformation for football association look like, what does financial management of an association look like. So you had basically ten years of soaking all the very best things you could see in European football. And we saw some federations, I suppose Portugal is a very good example. When I first met them in 2010, 2011, uh, from the FEI said, and then went to UEFA, they were hopeless, really poor off the pitch. Now I look at them, they've got a TV channel of 55 full-time people building products all the time. They've got e-commerce that is, is fantastic. They've got governance, which is fantastic. You name it, their infrastructure, um, the way they communicate is really superb. Um, and they've capitalized on the likes of Ronaldo and different things they've had and winning the Euros. But you have to capitalize. I've seen other federations. If you go back to, for example, in 88, when Ireland qualified for the Euros in 88, um, they had this huge growth of football. There was 2,000 clubs formed, essentially, around qualifying for the Euros. But the association didn't capitalize on the chance it has. And, I mean, when the chance comes to go to Wales, I go back a little bit. Um, two or three years ago, my own association where I'm from that I started as a, as a youth, I suppose, collapsed, essentially. They were bankrupt. Um, and I was sent home to rescue that situation, I suppose. And we had six months. I was taken on a succumbent from UEFA to Ireland for six months to take an association that was 90 million euros in debt and just give it hope. And that was difficult. We 215 staff couldn't pay the wages. So that was really getting you, you know, roll up the sleeves and, and get it out of there. So we had to do deals. Uh, with TV, with sponsors, with government and that to get them out of that mess. And thankfully, they really are on a good trajectory. The women's team is, you know, just qualified for the World Cup and Vera Powell was someone that I pointed while I was there. So, um, you know, to, to go back to my own federation and to my own country to help that federation gave me a taste of what it was like to put your own fingerprints on something and to create something, whether it's a painting or a piece of music, whatever. That's how it feels. It feels like it's a piece of, it's a creation. Um, and it's interesting because the FAW is 145 years old. We might not look at it, but we are. Um, it feels like Spotify at the moment. It feels like setting up a new company with a startup. It feels like we've got a blank canvas and it feels that we can create whatever we want. And I think you see some of the communications, the marketing and some of the outward expressions of how we view things. I think it feels like that. I think you can see how it feels in the inside. It feels that we're in a very special moment in Welsh football, building on the shoulders of people who built the football itself, which is the product, if you want to call it that. Um, but it feels that we have a chance to take it from just being football to something much bigger, which is probably part of a cultural evolution of the country. Um, that's how it feels. I don't know how that's how it looks, but it feels we're right at the epicenter of building social change. And that's quite interesting because I absolutely love football. I have to say I'm completely obsessed with football. It's all I look at all the time. But it's what football can do to communities. And I mean, there's layers of it. I mean, there's us on the world stage with 5 billion people watching us now gives us a great chance to communicate our values and different things. But there's layers below that. It's like, for example, in the local village, what we can do for the mental, physical, mind, body, soul of every person across the country, what football can do. Uh, people who even today aren't involved in football, what we're going to build over the next few years in terms of the Football Association of Wellness really excites me because I think we can touch people and communities in a way that nobody else can. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really hope over the next few years, while we're all here together doing this, that when we hand over the baton to the next people, that we'll have built something quite spectacular. We have a thing that we built in UEFA. It was, um, I just saw the thing earlier, it was helped to grow as the programme. We built the Grow programme, which is basically how to grow European football. And as part of that, I remember sitting in a room with the brightest minds we could find building football federation of the future. What does a federation look like by 2030? We sat for weeks and we built in all the different areas. What does a great football federation look like by 2030? And I have to say, like for me, it's clear in my mind what we will look like by 2030. It's really clear and it's pretty beautiful what it will look like. Mm. It's just to make sure that, as you know, there's a lot of politics in football. There's a lot of ebbs and flows. And it's trying as the leader of the association to take us through the ebbs and flows and to be on the top of the wave, I suppose. So when we get to where we are at the moment, I suppose, is to take full advantage because there will be dips, there will be issues we end up in that may not be as lovely as this, as to try and keep taking us through the ebbs and flows so that we can get to 2030 or whatever that is, uh, whatever time that is, where we actually like a flower just open up and everyone can see that 
on the pitch, you'd look at a Uruguay or a Croatia in the men's game, certainly, you know, four million people or so. They've created player after player after player. They really are seen as top, you know, in the top echelons of football. We're kind of there now. We're just on the cusp of it. But what we really want to be seen as world class is <coughs> on the pitch and off the pitch. We want to be seen as someone who's got a bit more about us. We've got values that, you know, show coming on the world stage, but also that we have something about us that everyone recognizes that's beyond just football. So that direction is interesting. We see clubs like San Pauli have achieved that, I suppose, even though they're in tier two of the German football. There's something about them that when I look at them, I go, they've got values, real values. There's certain bodies, you see, I mean, New Zealand, I went to see them on Saturday in the rugby. Um, there's something about New Zealand. There's something about their brand, for want of a better word, that's pretty special. And what we're trying to do is create something like that, but even better in much football. We're going to come back to a lot of those themes uh, because they're really important ones. But just staying with your uh, arrival in Wales, which is only 14, 15 months ago, tell us about your perception of us as a football nation. Or more broadly, tell us something that impressed you and something that has caused you some concern in terms of that big ambition. Yeah, I suppose what really impressed me was, and I hadn't quite grasped this, was how strong the coach education was, for example. It's amongst the best in the world, I have to say. I mean, the legs of Patrick Vieira, Thierry Henry, Roberto Martinez have come through our coach education system. And I hadn't quite grasped how good that was. The legacy of the likes of Osh and, you know, Gary Speed and the high performance side. I hadn't, I didn't realize how good it was. I didn't realize how close the players were. Um, and we knew that with the, I, in my first two days, I met the boys team, the men's senior team. I was really struck by the brotherhood amongst them. And then within a week, I'd met the women's team, and you could see what Gem was building was pretty special. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty. We know we've got greatness with the women's team coming uh, pretty soon as well. So we feel really good about that. So that was great to see the football side had come together. Then I suppose the downside um, really was grassroots facilities awful. I mean, I was stunned by how bad they were. Third world, I have to say. So. That was something that is right up there at the top of um, our priorities. I was aware that there was governance issues. Um, so at the moment, we look like a beautiful swan, I suppose. People look at the FAW and think that it's all great. We do have our moments that you can't see, I suppose, as much, uh, which is to do with governance. Change management is a big thing. I mean, we've changed a lot of the staff. We've changed a lot of the structures. We've changed essentially the entire management team uh, pretty much. And that, in a small country like Cymru, creates its own issues because everyone's related to somebody here. Uh, I'm afraid to insult anybody because um, I know that their brother or sister is probably going to walk by me later that day. Um, so that's quite interesting is in a very small country to do quite relatively quick change management without people noticing it's that quick. Mm. So you've got to kind of do it in a way that is very gentle and kind to the person and to what you're trying to do. But some people benefit massively from it. We've seen a lot of the kids at the FAW who were bursting with talent, who felt a bit frustrated that they couldn't show their stuff that they now can show their stuff. I hope that, I mean, for example, when I joined, there was quite a lot of issues with the staff. There had been a letter written by the staff to uh, the association saying they had deep concerns about how the thing was being run. Um, and that letter was a starting point. It was, it was pretty close to the edge, the letter, I would say, in terms of morale and things. And what we try and do is every three months as the CEO, I meet all of the staff in groups, so groups of eight. And it's really open season. They can say whatever they want. But how it was quite interesting because when we did the first lap of it, I could actually feel the frustration in the room. And that's only a year ago or so. Mm -hmm. I could feel almost anger in the room that they, they were given their time to work for football, but felt that they were being taken advantage of because they loved football, but they weren't being paid comparable to working, I don't know, here in the university or other companies around them. And we should never take advantage of somebody because they love football. We shouldn't take advantage that you, oh, you're so lucky to work for the FAW. Everyone has to be treated fairly. Everyone has to be better. like so. We did a benchmarking exercise with other companies to see well, what do they pay for? I don't know, an insights manager or a digital person or whatever it was. And we tried to get it right that we're paying what's fair, so we're paying what's fair for the role, but also that each person has a clear plan for where they're going and that there's honesty. So, if you Laura, if you're coming to a time where I just don't feel it's there's, there's another level for you to go, I have to be honest with you and say, Look, Laura, this is where you are. Are you enjoying it? How do we make the role more fulfilling? But if there's not levels to go, is to be honest with you. Um, and then if there is levels to go, is to paint a picture for you of how you're going to get to where you want to get to and see that that's fulfilling. I mean, a lovely thing happened during the week is someone who you know very well, the 
uh, head of women and girls football, Lowry was over in UEFA doing a course. And she sent me, I was at something last night, and she sent me her purpose. And she had spent a week with UEFA working through her purpose. And it's not fair for me to give that purpose. That's for her to give. But I have to say, when I read it, I went, Oof, that was pretty powerful what I saw. Um, and when I see some of the kids, I mean, if you look at yesterday, we quite a big day yesterday, we launched a sustainability strategy, which may not have been as sexy to some people as the World Cup song, I would say. Um, but for all, for me, it was spectacular because it was the best sustainability strategy I've ever seen for a, for a, for a governing sports body. Uh, it was done with the Welsh government, with Sophie Howe and the well-being. So when I came to when I first came to the country, I was struck by this piece of legislation that was the Wellbeing Act. You know, for future generations, I'd never seen that before. I know, for example, Ireland, my own country, is now looking to bring that legislation to Ireland with Simon Coveney, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who's looking at that quite deeply. But I saw things that you could see were bursting into life, like, you know, a new energy in the country. You could see where our football, it was quite good. You could see the women's game was growing, which I know we'll talk about hopefully uh, quite soon. Um, but there was all these young staff. And if you, I mean, I suppose part of my job is to bring all these things together, to look at the governance issues which we're facing. And there's other sports around us that have governance issues quite clearly. We were in the same boat, I would say, recently. Uh, so within two months of being here, I think, we had launched a new strategy, our Wales, uh, Ian Cymru, which set out the next six years. That was really important to that quite quickly, I felt, because if you didn't lay out the roadmap, people didn't know where they were going. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was really urgent. Lay out the roadmap. Here's the six things we're going to do. We're going to drive high performance. We're going to be a sustainable association for the future. We're going to drive participation. We're going to build a great workforce. We're going to build inspirational, fit for purpose facilities. And we're going to put Wales on the world stage. They were the six things. We said it, and this is how we're going to do it. You can look today, if you want, on our website. There's a Ein Cymru website, where you can look at the 80 or 90 commitments that we have, how we're doing against each one of them. It's publicly available, how we're delivering our strategy. So there's no hiding place for us in terms of what we committed to and what we're delivering. But what was probably even more important was strategy launched. We had Stuart Regan, who was the CEO of um, Scottish football, came into a full root and branch review of Welsh football, the, the good, the bad and the ugly. And he presented to us 80 recommendations now, 80 recommendations, they were pretty deep. Some of these were really deep to people. Um, we went to Wrexham for two days and we presented the 80 recommendations. And it wasn't you could kind of cherry pick the ones you wanted to take. It was either you do them all or nothing. And I have to be very clear in this. If, in my mind, even though I was only here two or three months, I was really happy to, if it didn't work, because I knew that, that was all or nothing. It was like the Netflix series. It was all or nothing up there. If it hadn't gone through, I would say, we would not be sitting here today. I wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, so it was pretty much, unless we take this medicine, which we have to take or take this improvement plan, then we're not gonna reach our potential. Thankfully, our full council signed off on the AT recommendations. And that then was literally, I remember driving back from Wrexham, back to Cardiff um, that afternoon. And I, I don't even remember the journey. I was kind of on a cloud nine really because I realized the potential for us was then enormous. It was really like breakthrough moment. And I was only here two or three months at the time. I remember thinking, I knew you had to do it early. And this is probably part of recognizing the timing because they'd invested in me. They had gone through a whole process where they'd selected me as the person to lead the organization. And if they didn't back you on the first big call, then what was the point? Well, I remember you ringing me on the way back from Wrexham to have this conversation. Um, I know people will want to come in in a moment and we're going to talk about the World Cup and the women's game as well. But tell me, tell me what you think about the attitude of Cymru generally, the people, the organisations. I mean, I've written a lot about this, talking about poor self-confidence and low ambition in terms of what we can do. And, and football is very distinctive, isn't it, in that we're an independent football nation on the world stage in UEFA and in FIFA. We're treated the same as England, Scotland, uh, Portugal, Spain, and so on. Um, how do you see that playing out here? Because the FAW, in a way, has um, tilted its communications to be far more outward looking, to be far more political, as you say. Is that cultural, deliberate? Political, cultural. Well, small p political, which is which includes culture as well, of course. So tell us a bit about what your impression was when you came here. Well, um, I know we've, we've, we've talked about before, the, the lack of confidence to me was pretty clear. Um, even though where I'm from is only a short swim away, it was really noticeable to me um, that, you know, in I was in Dublin during the week. I went with Neville Southall and Ian Rush to do some stuff over with the Welsh government there. But I even noticed when I got back to Dublin, talking to the business community there, it was really, it's full of beans, is the best way of putting it. It's full of what we can achieve and what we can do. 
and you only have to look at the outreach in terms of international business development, I would say, from the countries. I know that we probably try our best here, but it's miles and miles and miles off what's possible. Uh, if you look at tourism, for example, we're miles and miles and miles off what they've done down their West Coast, as an example. And there's not an awful lot of difference between our West Coast and the Irish West Coast, but they've built a brand around the Wild Atlantic Way, and it's pretty spectacular. It's, summers are just j jointed over there because of what they've done in terms of building a brand internationally. I think you know that they've done a very good job of building a brand. And I think some of it comes from a confidence. I noticed that sitting in rooms with, um, with people in UEFA, for example, you know, you take the Swiss that Swiss German mindset of event planning, it's it's a bit stereotypical, but it's you go to UEFA event and you've been to loads of them. They are almost perfection. They have rows amongst them about like the texture of the napkin. And you're like, God almighty, that's a bit, you know, but they really do. I mean, the look and feel of the music, this, the tone of the music when you walk into buildings, it's pretty spectacular to watch our event management team at UEFA, how they operate. And it, it gives a lesson where I've been around them for 10 years. So, when you come here and you go, okay, it'll be fine attitude doesn't really work mm. at the highest level. It won't be fine, actually. It'll be fine if you plan it meticulously and you think it right through and you have all the resources in place to deliver. It's like when you have a strategy. You know, we launched a sustainability strategy yesterday. We've had to think through the financial management of that strategy. There's no point launching a strategy if you don't have the resources or the people or the things in place. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper then. So we've got to think through every part of what we do, but we've got to bring people with us who think through all of that stuff. I mean, there's someone here, I mentioned Dylan, for example, uh, who's here in the audience. We brought him in from a Japanese bank as an example. And his job was to, is to look at research insights and data so that we make our decisions based on data and insights, not what I want or what you know, the people around me want. It's we look at what the population would like, the direction they'd like us to go in, what works well and what doesn't work well. And we tailor our communications and marketing, I suppose, to what we think is um, the right way of doing things. I mean, things that really annoy me, for example, is we played the Netherlands on a Saturday night in Cardiff City Stadium. It was Division A of the Nations League. We had Gareth Bale playing in his home city, Aaron Ramsey, Aaron Ramsey playing in his hometown in many, in many ways. The Dutch had world-class players and it was 3,000 empty seats. That really annoyed me. And I could feel our own team kind of going, ah, it's only a few seats now. That really annoyed me. Mm -hmm. We need to have this kind of fear of missing out to go to our games. If we're going to go from where we are now, a core of 25, 26,000, I guess, to go to 50, 60,000 as a core, you know, you need to be quite serious if you're going to do that. And you need to be really serious about the brand you're building. You need to think about how you do things. You need to think about will Cardiff City Stadium be big enough for us, by the way, when we get to when we get to it, possibly not. And that has to be, you need know, to think through how are we going to build that stadium with this council and with the government or whoever it is, if we're going to do that. So, you know, it takes planning. You can't kind of just make it up as you go along. You need people around you who don't make it up as they go along. You know, for example, in our commercial offering, you know, we've a long way to go to where we're going to get to. We want to build, bring big brands that believe in us with us. And one of the difficult things here is that in Comrie, there's not really huge brands that you can bring with you. That's a problem. And if you look at the business here, you know, if I look at when I was doing a similar job in Ireland, I saw huge brands around me with huge budgets. I don't quite see that here. So that means we have to be more innovative. We have to be more agile. We have to accentuate our brand even stronger. So in a crowded marketplace that we really stand out. And I think to be fair to our communications and marketing team, they do stand out. There's going to be a lot of questions. I appreciate that online and in person. But let's just move on to the World Cup. We're, we're 13 days away from Cambridge's first game against the USA. Um, you know, how, how are you feeling? I mean, like all of us, probably excited and nervous, but tell us a bit about, you know, how you see this playing out. I mean, we can't control things that will happen on the field. We hope that we'll get through the group. And then once you're in the round of 16, anything can happen, as we know, from Euros 2016. But tell us what else we hope to get out of this for football and for, for Cymru as a nation. What I would say is I think the team Cymru, and you've seen a bit of it yourself, has been really good around this. I was worried at the start when we qualified against Ukraine. I thought, is this going to be a case of silos and people not working together and it's going to be a bit of a mess, you know, that we're doing our stuff and someone else is doing something else and all that. That hasn't happened. And it just shows that when we work together, we can be pretty spectacular. You know, so I've, you know, I kind of was a bit naughty in terms of saying what the lack of confidence a bit. That genuinely is how I felt, by the way. That's mm -hmm. not, um, then when I saw us work together, I was full of joy because, you know, right from, I have to say, First Minister, who's been really engaged with this with us, um, through to all the different agencies, whether it's the Arts Council, 
whether it was uh, the earth, whoever it was, all these different bodies. And there's been, I don't know, 20 different bodies have come together. And it's really been one team, one Cymru jersey working together. To be fair, the government put some funding up, as you know. Um, but just everything has kind of synchronized. And what I think we can do is, first of all, I'm not nervous with the football. That's not my job, thankfully. Uh, that's Rob's job. Uh, and you'll see him announcing his squad tomorrow night, and that's him to do. But our job is to create the environment where people have confidence and they feel we're going the right direction, even when we're talking to the players. So every camp we talk to the players about our strategy and what we're trying to do, and they're really engaged by it. And to give them the feeling that we're building, which we will do from this tournament, we'll build on in Hensel to build in facilities for the women and men that make sure they realise that we're heading more and more world-class in everything that we do. But in terms of what we can do with 5 billion people watching us, mm -hmm. we just as a simple example, we looked at the idea of the kind of stereotypical fan zone of having loads of people in the um, Principality Stadium, maybe, or Cardiff City Stadium drinking pints and the big screens. And we just thought, no, nah, that's not really us anymore. That just isn't us. Um, it didn't feel right. And I think what we tried to do is to bring the creativity of the country, the arts, the music, the language, the culture, the heritage out through Goyle Cymru, which is a name the guys found from 1958. There was a Goyle Cymru festival back here in the 50s, in the same years we last qualified for the World Cup, they found it in some old showreel. And we looked at it, we were thinking about calling it Tai Wall Goch, which made some sense to me as the Red Wall House, but the, just to show that it's not autocratic here, the team came back and said, we much prefer Goyle Cymru. And the more I thought about it, the more it sunk in that this was really clever. So we have over 200 venues across the country, which is small villages, some really kind of ad hoc um, art going on to much more seasoned venues, I suppose. I was in Abertivy on Friday night. I saw a lovely place called Mulder, I think it's called. Uh, there was a beautiful art theatre down there and beautiful venues across the place. And I was just looking to see what it's going to be like when we have the branding up of Goyle Cymru, when there's people doing poetry and music and using the language and that. It's going to be beautiful. And it's only a start for us. I mean, we'll qualify for 24, of course, quite quickly after. There's only a year next year to qualify. And then we'll go into overdrive with... Um, with our brand. So the World Cup for us came quite quickly. We qualified in June and that brings its own problems. I mean, as the CEO, I've had to deal with the kit, for example. You know, Adidas did a brilliant job of trying to get kit in for us, but because we qualified so late, a kit cycle is nine months or so, which didn't give us the time. So we have issues in the shops over Christmas, for example. We don't quite have enough baby kits or enough female kits, for example. That's difficult because you want to have everything for everybody. Of course you do. Um, but there are issues because we qualified late, because we qualified late with issues on uh, logistics out there, uh, getting the right hotel, getting the right training grounds. But thankfully, I have to say, I can honestly say sitting here, I say 13 days before the tournament, I have not a single worry. The only thing in the back of my mind is, is being Irish that in 2002, we went to um, play in the World Cup in Japan and South Korea and our captain who played for Manchester United at the time went home before the tournament started because they didn't. And he texted me recently. I don't know if I should say this on the camera. <laughs> he, he texted me recently and just said, make sure you bring the bibs and balls with you. Uh, so, um, I think you know, Gareth will be going home. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was funny because I actually said it to Rob recently. I was talking to so I was just saying, like, it's funny because everything's going the right direction. Our team are experienced, really experienced now at going to major competitions. Thankfully, this is not, I mean, it's obviously it's great to go to World Cup, but the team are quite used to going to tournaments. It's quite funny to see it. It's almost like they're in that mode now of this is what we do. Every single day at 11 o'clock Qatar time, 8 o'clock Cardiff time, we'll meet as a team and we'll go through what worked well that day and what on the next day. We're already meeting. So we start, we've started meeting pretty much on a daily basis now. Uh, but from this weekend, it'll go into overdrive. We meet in a hotel on Sunday uh, with the players. We train in Cardiff City Stadium on Tuesday morning and we go straight to the airport and get on a flight to go to Doha. Over there, then, we're thinking about like what we can do for the supporters. So there's been lots of discussion around the big fan zones. There is some different places. We're bringing Daffod Yoon with us, of course. The Barry Horns are there. There's other people going. Uh, Sage Todd is going, I believe, now. I don't know if that's out there, but it's out there now. Um, so th um, there's lots of different artists going. And I think there'll be lovely little spaces over there for people to enjoy the World Cup. So we're trying to get it right that over there that it works but for the players. So even... We're starting to think a bit like that UEFA concept I was thinking about. In the player's room, the team have thought about what does the bedroom look like for the player when they go back and go in, or when they first arrive into that room, what does the branding look like? Because it's a standard Middle Eastern hotel room, but we've come, come right that I suppose, and we've got branding in there that will remind the player of who they're playing for, what they're playing for. I mean, they all got to meet Michael Sheen, which was a spectacular 
morning for us uh, out in the Vale when he came in and gave that speech. It was unbelievable to watch. It was just incredible. We've tried to remind him of how they felt that morning throughout the tournament. That there will be three million um, breaths on their neck when they go on the pitch of pure support for them. And I must say, one thing that's really struck me is the pure support for what we're doing. It's not a false support. That's important to say. And it's not a support just for the team. I can also feel the energy of people on the street. If I go into a cafe, of people saying the FAW itself represents us. It is inclusive. I mean, the work of, say, Jason Weber and Caris Ingram, for example, the work they do with the Rainbow Wall of inclusivity, the fact that we're going to a country where uh, human rights, you know, are obviously in question, um, that the values of the, you know, of, of the culture we're going into have been discussed widely. We've made our position quite clear. The Welsh government have made their position quite clear with a value statement that they have. We've been quite open in saying we want to use this tournament as an opportunity for progress rather than, you know, how do we talk about equality, inclusion and diversity if we're not willing to sit down with people and say, you know, could we look at things this way? Is there a way of progressing the world with this tournament? Now, what I would say, I know I'm going into Qatar quite quickly, but the legislative developments that they've made are quite stunning. If you look at actually what they've written in the last couple of years in terms of dropping kafala, migrant movement of labour, all these different things have been really good, actually. It's the enforcement. And as you may have seen on Sunday, we wrote a letter with the other European nations looking for clarity on the migrant centre. Again, being Irish, we all left Ireland, um, our ancestors to go to America and Australia uh, and the UK many years ago. When we got there, um, you know, we would love to have had a migrant centre that explained how does this country work? How do you fill up the forms? That's what a migrant centre basically is. And if someone feels they're not being treated well, they can go to this place in Qatar to understand, you know, and get help, I suppose. And the second thing is the compensation fund, which is not always easy to administer a compensation fund as we go further and further into it. But we do want clarity on this compensation fund that the workers who are involved in it in the, in the World Cup and those who were injured and lost lives from reports that we see that their families not are compensated in that. I mean, for us, they're pretty basic things that should be in place. But we do want to make sure that we leave the World Cup. But as, as we said, as one of our strategic pillars is Wales on the world stage. It's not just about hosting your 28, which we hope to do in this city uh, in a few years' time. It's not just about, you know, getting the women's team to the Euros now <laughs> in the football side. It's about making a statement internationally. And that's where I think Team Conley have come together really well. This value statement by the Welsh Government, what the conversations we've had with the Welsh Government and various actors has demonstrated to me that while I spoke up very much about Ireland and, you know, their um, confidence and their international reach, I definitely see an opportunity for us and hopefully football playing a very front role of not just catching up with them, but surpassing them in our time. And I think going to the World Cup gives us a perfect platform to speak on things and to open our hearts up to the values that we have that excites people and delights people, I hope. I'm sure there's going to be questions on the World Cup and some of the ethics and boycotts and everything else. But just to finish from me, before we go to the floor and online, talk, let's talk about the women's game. I mean, we had the most fantastic campaign, but only in the sense that it was fantastic whilst it was going on. We, we failed at the final hurdle. Um, and as people who are trying to um, be ambitious about our goals, that wasn't good enough. We didn't get to Australia, New Zealand. We were hoping we'd have two World Cups to look forward to. Um, and I think we all know in the game, and you know, because I mean, you're, you're constantly on this, that to, to progress the women's game, we need to up the ante constantly, because if we do what we're doing now, we'll fall back because other nations are, are growing their game. So so what? tell us strategically what we need to do to make sure that Gemma and the girls qualify for the Euros or the next World Cup. Well, they have been building in the background the regional centres, which we have north and south, which is basically the young girls playing with the boys, an age or two below them. Our research shows that that's really important, that they do get to tackle and physio physiology and all that kind of stuff, that in USW here in the South and up in Wrexham, we've got these young girls playing against boys every week, really high quality. That won't be seen for a few years because they're 16s and 14s. We've just brought in someone I think is going to make a big impact in Welsh football. Gemma Lewis has come from New Zealand. She's Welsh, she's from Barry, but she's worked with New Zealand, very high performing athletes, footballers down in New Zealand. So we've brought, just brought her back here um, and invested in her to be the person responsible for all the talent that comes through. Um, with the manager, for example, with Gemma Granger, we're in talks with her about staying a bit longer maybe um, in Cymru because we really believe in her. Um, we believe in what she brings to 
um, to the values of the team. I mean, even I know they had meetings with the players in the last couple of days about debriefing on the last campaign. They're playing film, as you know, over in the Peninsula are now. But she represents the FAW very well because she works with the values of the players and what different camps mean to them. So she fits us absolutely perfectly. What, one thing I know you and I have discussed this quite a lot is, you know, to really drive the women's game forward, to drive the game forward, not just the women's game forward, we need to keep evolving our governance structures. So it's fine for us in the executive to say we're going to do this and that, but we need a board and we need a council that really reflects a modern Cymru, you know, that has not just the gender parity, which we've signed up to, you know, as part of Sustainable Association Future, it's fine to say we have 40% gender parity by 2026, not because we're ticking boxes, because it makes us, it, we make much better decisions. As a simple example, if you look at the management team last year, we had nine males and one female, for example, on the management team. Now I think it's four and three or four and four, something like that. But I can feed in that management team because we're much closer to gender parity. Gender parity is one thing, but obviously it's diversity of backgrounds. You know, people who come from different classes, people who come from different uh, parts of the world even, you know, once we have that diversity in our thinking, we're much, much better. That would allow us to make much, much better for the, for the women's game, because I still, even though, I mean, it's something that we say a bit, as a percentage of our turnover, we spend more than any other federation in Europe on the women's game. That's happened over the last two years, really. There's been influence from the likes of yourself, Laura, I would say, the likes of Tim on the board and others, Carol and other people on the board who've pushed, and Lowry's great work as well, and others have really pushed to drive up what we're spending on the women's game. But we've a long way to go. So if you think about um, professionalization, our men's team is populated by a lot of uh, young uh, of Welsh males who've come through our system, whether it's the Swansea. Swansea's Academy produced a lot of players that are going to Qatar right throughout the side. Cardiff have produced a lot of players, of course, that are going. And then a lot of like the Garrets and that went a bit younger into the English system. The thing is here, we've got to think about, you know, our big clubs, how they're moving towards professional football. They're not professional yet. Um, but certainly that journey towards them becoming professional, I think, is important. I think it won't be long before you see a professional side mm -hmm. in Cymru. Obviously, the FAW would love if that professional side was playing in the Welsh system. But from an international high performance angle, we've benefited hugely, I have to say, um, from our clubs playing in the English system. Um, let's, let's not shy away from that. Um, if you look at um, the players that come through that are going to guitar, because if I go up to USW on a Saturday morning, I can see the young boys now, and increasingly the girls, playing against Manchester United or Aston Villa, getting access to the very best young kids in the world because of the way that the geographically were set up. So I think that between the, the regional centres that they've built up, which get huge high-performance coaching, there's the regional centres, which the likes of Laura, the goalkeeper, for example, is in because she's not playing in the English system, that she gets access to high-quality, high-performance training. Gemma Lewis joining us, as very much um, the head of performance pathways, we've just changed our talent ID system. So as a simple example, just take one position that I played in as goalkeeper. When I first came, I had real concerns about the goalkeeping position because Laura is not professional. Um, she's been fantastic, by the way. The last four games campaign, she was amazing. In particular, she was really top class. But you've got to look forward, as I said, you've got to keep thinking. And then I saw in the Pinnacle Cup, we'd lived, played an excellent clean sheet against Belgium. But then I see that we found this girl from Manchester United, 16, Safi. And I watched her warming up before the Greece game. I said, that's a real superstar. You can see in her, the way she delivers the ball, her confidence, her, as we say, gatch, her movement. This is a star in the making. So because of our talent ID, because of the geography of the country, we need to have the most talented talent ID team that's going out across the UK, particularly looking for the next Gareth, the next Jess. And they may not, for us, I mean, being Irish, most Irish people don't live in Ireland, obviously. We're in America, we're in Australia, we're across continental Europe, we're all across the UK. So if, I'll give you a simple example. When I was in the FAI, we found two players, Declan Rice and Jack Grealish. They're both 100 million pound players. What difference would they have made to the Irish senior team, the two of them? Now, whatever they found them, keeping them is a different thing. So if you, take, if you take Luke Harris, for example, I think it's fair to say that anybody who studied um, the young players coming through would see Luke Harris as a real talent. He grew up in Jersey. He was spotted by a guy called Malcolm Elias, who was at Fulham, the Fulham Academy, who's very close to us, Welsh, uh, comes to our games, close to Osh and different people. Luke is 17. 
Fulham's under 23s played Chelsea's under 20s, 23s recently. It was in, just after pre season. Uh, so it would have been September time, maybe. Because I know that because Ethan Ampadu was playing. Ben Chilwell was left back. I think they had Kepa in goals. Uh, Fulham beat them 3 0, and Lou scored all three from midfield. And if I believe the newspapers, the Chelsea came with quite a significant offer for him after. And anyone I listen to says this kid is pretty special. Now, his mother's from Cork. He's with us. But Rob brought him into the squad uh, for the last camp. And I was just kind of on the edge of the camp. I don't get too close. I give a talk to the players about our strategy. But I was watching him. And I was watching the way that Gareth and Aaron and the boys just put their arm around him and brought him in. And I could look at him and I could say, he's going nowhere. He can feel, he feels part of that squad already, the way they've brought him in. And if I think about something else, which is really, really important, um, the way that the women as well, I have to, I'm watching the way they interact with each other. It's quite special what we have. When I first came here, I was told a certain player, I won't name, was going off to play for England in the 20s. We were looking at him, but he was going off to play for England. And I was like, oh no, I'll get in the car and I'll drive to the parents' house and I'll go down on my knees and beg. Don't bother. Let him go. That's what they do. Mm. They go on train with England, but they always come back. We don't lose anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They come back because they come into our... And that's the other side. I mean, I, earlier I was complaining a little bit about you know, maybe confidence in that, but there's another side to that, which is that when people come to us and see our vulnerabilities and see our raw emotion of wanting to play for Wales and wanting to play for coming on the world stage, they really want to be part of it. It's so welcoming. It's so yeah. just cry so that we don't lose anybody. We don't lose Declan yeah, Rice or yeah. Jack Grealish. They stay. I'm conscious of time and I want people to be able to come in. So have we got some online questions first and then we'll come to the audience present. Hi, Noel. Firstly, lots of um, thanks to you and what you've done for Football in Wales and people can really see your passion when you talk. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of questions around your leadership. Um, can you tell us a, a bit more about how you're building resilience and cultivating talent at a leadership level within and around the FAW? to ensure continuity when you retire from your current role with Cymru in the third year? Well, first of all, it's a great question, by the way, because for me, I, I may have said so earlier, creating the conditions for success. I mean, you know, if it becomes what, what I'm doing, that's a real problem. I've seen football federations where the CEO is too strong, actually, and that doesn't work. You know, you need to bring everyone with you and bring people around you who are much better. I know it's a cliche, but it's so true. You need people who are much more talented. So what you see at the moment, for example, in the marketing communications, that expression of itself, there's a team in the FAW that are so talented. They're so gifted. Um, really, it's just a joy to work with them. Um, if I look, for example, at coach education, I've watched them and I go, oof, they're off the scale. And for them, you just want to keep encouraging them. I mean, we I mentioned Lowry earlier, for example, in the women and girls game. We can't give them enough money to develop the thing because we know that every pound we give them is going to be well spent, well invested because they're just so talented. They're just an extraordinary team, I would say. Um, so we've got to do is look at the areas that we need to expand on. I said, Dylan, I mentioned earlier, insights research and that we need to make sure that that's developed. Yesterday, we were on a call looking at the future of insights and research and using data. If you look at our connection with universities like here, like Swansea University, like USW, I know Nick here from our, from our marketing team is here as well, who's doing a brilliant job of working with institutions to build partnerships that give us the edge. So we've got to use the whole country and all the resources and assets that we have. I'll give you a simple example. You talk about fine margins. In Swansea, they're developing a fabric that after the anthem, because that's a really dangerous time, after the anthem, when the players are, or during the anthem, in fact, players' muscles change because they've warmed up. That five or six minutes is really dangerous because they can lose their edge, their full warmth. And that's where injuries happen, all that kind of stuff. And half time is dangerous, of course. So they're building a fabric that keeps the body at perfect temperature in Swansea. They're building mouth shields, for example, on the heading of a ball, what impact that has on the brain and different things. So what we're trying to do is have a much more academic approach to make sure, and that isn't just on the performance side, it's also on our, on our performance of leadership. So I'm going straight from here to a course on leadership uh, with the IOD actually which is about making sure that we have the very best practices of leadership, which is encouraging people to be great. I'll give you a very simple example. On Sunday, I went to see our junior council. So as part of Sustainable Association of the Future, we've set up a council that has decision-making you know, um, part to them. Um, they're aged between 16 and 24. They're 50% male and female, but they're very diverse background, people from Muslim backgrounds, people from England and all different sorts in, in it. 
Um, and I would, couldn't believe how talented these kids were. I was sitting there, just my mouth open, listening to them, going, they should be running the FAW, and I hope they will run the FAW in the future. So what we've got to do is try to create an environment where you can make mistakes. I'll give you a really funny example. Ian Gwyn Hughes is, you know, someone I listen to a lot because he's got such a good view on Cymru and the world, I suppose, and how we connect. A lot of the magic you see that comes out of the FW comes from him and people around him. So I don't have to do anything. It's great. Just let them at it. But I remember last, um, last uh, early this year, we were playing Austria in the playoff semi-final. And I was sitting with him. And he said, you know what? We should try and do this song before the game. I had never heard of the song. And I was like, okay. And I said, um, well, what about the players? You know, when they come out, will they be kind of annoyed because they're warming up? And I was thinking from the player perspective, if you had this kind of noise going on in the background, you know, would the player think that it was distracting them? But what you kind of go do is you look at someone like IG and you say, if he thinks it's the right thing to do, then it must be probably the right thing to do. So again, I'd never heard of the song, never heard a word of it. And I remember walking out and looking around the stadium and going, oh my God, what the hell is that? And I saw, you know, 20 something thousand people at the time before the game singing in perfect camaraderie. I was like, oh, there's something quite special here. And then you realize that because of the lack of confidence that we mentioned earlier, I'd missed some opportunities because people probably weren't forceful enough with me. And because I'm from a slightly different culture, I'd missed that they were saying something to me, but not wanting to force it at me almost. So they were a little bit, this is a good idea. I was like, okay, and they walked away and I didn't take it on board. And now I hope that people realize that we can make loads of mistakes. We'll make mistakes in Qatar. I just hope we bring the bibs and balls. Um, <laughs> but, we, you know, I hope, we, you know, we can make mistakes and we should be really open to making mistakes. And if someone makes a mistake, I know it sounds again like a cliche that we read in the business books now, but it's really true as you say, well done. You make a mistake, but you tried. And it didn't work out so well, but you tried. And if we keep thinking like that and try to be, gentle with people and let them express themselves fully what you'll find more often than not is that people are very good at what they do and if you let them express themselves but i mean again i'm sorry to pick a new Dylan today but he presented to me yesterday morning i was like i don't even know why i'm engaged with him in the conversation because he's so far ahead of me and what he's thinking it's good for me just to know it's more an fyi than this is what i should do so what you're trying to do is create an energy and an ecosystem where everyone feels that they're really in the right track. The problem slightly for us is you've got an FAW that's, I don't know, when I joined it was 70 people. Now it's 120 in a year. So it's quite a big growth. We're in a big growth phase, uh, which is interesting. Um, but that's the professional executive side of the football in Wales. If you think about the country, there's um, six or 7,000 coaches. There's probably 10,000 volunteers out there. There's 1,000 clubs almost out there. How do you bring, for want of a much better word, the workforce of that up when they're volunteers? So that's a real trick that we have to come up with is how do you bring 10, an army of 10,000 people across the country to that level? Another example being public affairs. When I joined, public affairs was almost non-existent. When I say public affairs, I mean interaction with the government, um, interaction with the 22 local authorities. In January, we bring in Helen Antoniazzi, who uh, comes from Quarateg. Uh, she is head of public affairs there. She joins the FAW. Again, I don't know if that's out there, but it's out there now. Uh, so Helen joins us in January as the head of public affairs. And her job will be to work with the 950 odd clubs to champion their issues with the 22 local authorities, to champion us with the government, and not just with Sport Wales or the Department of Sport, but with cross cutting into health. As I mentioned earlier, I think we can play a huge role in social prescribing and making a healthier nation with education, with all these different areas, the economy, for example, how can we help in driving tourism and business and all that kind of stuff? So, you know, we are growing so fast. But what we need to do is when Helen joins, you talk about resilience. I'm going to sit with Helen. I don't think I need to for long. Just say, Helen, you just get out there and express the hell out yourself. You wouldn't be here if you weren't brilliant. You've gone through a huge process to become our head of public affairs. I mean, on her first interview, for example, she met Laura and Carwin Jones, the last first minister. That was the first interview. And she had to go to a process. That's quite daunting for anybody. You didn't put her off. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was Karen. You, you met her, obviously. But that was the process. It's a, fine, it's a fine process to get in now. It's going to get more difficult, I would say, to get into the FAW. Because when we put up a role, for example, we're looking for a chief financial officer at the moment and a chief operations officer, very significant roles in the management team. The quality of people that are applying is unbelievable. It really is unbelievable who's applying for these jobs. And I think what that is is a reflection of people seeing what we do they're buying into it. And that means that the quality will go up again. And that simply means the output that we have will be more quality. So in a simple answer to your question, sorry, Laura, is to create an environment where you can make mistakes, you know, 
I do wake up some mornings. Yesterday was a good example. We put out the World Cup song out, and there was a moment where the button is press send, and you don't quite know what the reaction will be. You, will people think it's rubbish? I don't know. Um, and then you realize that people really like what we're doing. And that's a really nice moment when you realize that we're connecting with people in a way uh, that's pretty special. Sorry? All oh, right, very good. <laughs> oh, very good. We've got another quick one from online, and then we'll go to the audience. And, uh, let's go to the audience. And if you could put your hand up if you want to ask a question, or there you go, Alan. Actually, it's a question for you, Laura. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I meant to just be you on the spot. This, but go ahead. We know, we know no likes to talk, so we'll give him a rest. <laughs> um, creating a post World Cup legacy is going to be really important for Wales. So, will you run for the FIFA Council again? Uh, and do you think the World Cup qualification will help, especially with Italy not qualifying? <laughs> I've got to be a little bit careful about what I say here, haven't I? No, but um, I think. I, I'm keen to stand again. I've had lots of support from Noel and the team. And I think we've approached it from the point of view of it doesn't have to be the FIFA role. It might be something within UEFA um, were that to become possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm heading out to Geneva later on today to chair the women's football part of a future of football convention that's organised by UEFA which I, we think is good for us, that they're asking me to chair that um, uh, because clearly the women's game is, is enormous for UEFA and for FIFA at the moment. And that gives me an opportunity to talk to the president and other key individuals there. But I, but I have to say, you know, it isn't about me per se. I've always, I've always said that, you know, I, I would like to give everything I can to football because it's given me so much in my own career and I feel it's a way of paying back. But I think whatever happens, you know, hopefully my last campaign when I came within six votes of beating my Italian opponent, who, by the way, um, ignored me totally afterwards. So clearly we made some impact on, on that. Um, whatever happens, you know, I hope that we will have paved the way for another woman to come behind me. If it's not me, fine. I think the way all of us women in leaders have approached this is that if it doesn't happen for us, we know we'll have at least laid the foundations for another woman to come behind us and take that office. But I hope I hope I'll have an opportunity. Noel, Noel will say what he thinks on this. For me, look, um, when I saw Laura, I was in UA for the time. I didn't know enough about uh, Cymru at the time, but I looked at Laura and said, oh my God, what a perfect face, what a perfect image, what a perfect um, brain, perfect soul for driving world football forward. I mean, as a football fan, which many of us are, if Laura's at the table at where decisions are made, I know we won't go far wrong. Um, and, you know, for us at the FAW, we couldn't be more supportive. Um, Laura knows our view of if, I mean, I think Laura again has been disingenuous by saying paving the way for somebody else. We want Laura in there, to be quite honest with you. Um, we've made that pretty clear. She's very popular with UEFA. Um, and I think she, the platform is set. For her to go on and to represent us at the world stage um so i really hope it happens sooner rather than later because i think if laura's there football will be in a much better place thank you enough about me <laughs> uh okay who's next uh gentleman there yeah uh, uh, John Dewey, uh, uh studio e for single uh Kadith. um i just you spoke on the uh managing the growth of football and it's more uh on the women's side of women's side of the game um i've been at games before there's where there's only 12 people there so you can imagine my shock being one of the 88,000 at wembley this uh, summer as england won the euros um and also obviously with Kumrai against uh bosnia i was also there which was a great game to be at um how do you manage that in a way is it sort of go now you know jump on not jump on the bandwagon but capitalize on the massive popularity that it's now growing or is it more sort of a you know sort of calm down sort of see where we're going with it and manage it sustainably and also my follow-up question is uh, what do i have to say now to get kumrai versus lionesses at prince Palace stadium this year well the first thing is it's not see how it goes it's throw everything we've got at it and really get on the crest of the wave i would say so we definitely need to bring in more people i mean the marketing communications area for women's football, the grassroots level, for example, is something that we need to invest in because facilities, I mean, last week, like one of the things I was really proud of is that when we qualified for the World Cup, we said to the players, for the World Cup, we make about four million pounds net. 
and that we put that four million pounds, all of it, into a fund that basically will fit will fund facilities. And a big part of that criteria will be: is it an environment for her? So when you've got a six-year-old girl who, you know, has seen some football, might be interested in trying to play, if they turn up, as we say, at this stereotypical dress room, which is a big steel door and concrete and urinal hits you in the face and that kind of stuff, it's not very conducive to a young girl being welcomed into football. So making sure the environment for her, and in terms of coaching, for example, we need a lot more female coaches uh, as well, because we know that girls are more comfortable if there's a female coach, by the way. You know, So with the research that we talked about earlier, we can see all these things We've got to react to them by putting money into them. Um, we need to bring in people who drive the women's game forward. So, and when you talk about growth, we were talking about normal business. We were talking about selling toothbrushes or something like that. Last year, we had, I don't know, 1,500 people at a game. Now we're at 15,000. So I don't know, is that 1,000% growth? There's some mathematician will tell me. Um, it's not 100% growth. It's 1,000% growth in a year in terms of audiences. And Dylan, again, did some research um, on who came to their matches and what did they feel about their matches and would they come back again? And the answer is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly yes. So that means now that Lowry and her team uh, have got 15,000 people who've been exposed to what it's like to watch Cymru play uh, live here and what that means. Um, and that's brilliant because it means there's a platform now to build on. Disappointment for us and Laura's part of this because she's um, coach, uh, she's a, a deputy chair for the Women's Committee in UEFA and she was very helpful I must say, on this matter where we just don't think that it's set up correctly at the moment for the women's internationals. I give you an example. We were a kick of a ball away, I suppose, from getting through to the playoffs, I think, of the Women's World Cup um, finals. It was a bit weird, the whole setup in the end, but we got there. Um, the gap between there too big. It's just too big. And with Gemma Granger going off to Spain now with the team to Finland, a debrief for this camp. There's a big gap, I think, with Friendly's end in March. It was too long. So thankfully, UEFA are coming with the UEFA Nations League for women, essentially, which means we'll be playing good sides much more regularly, which is good for the national team. But what you've got is this explosion of girls. And I mean this, explosion of girls playing football. So if we put the environments right, we're going to just run away with it, honestly. And here's the thing. People say, oh, it's great now that football is the biggest interest sport and the biggest participation sport in, in the country. I'm like, we should be so far ahead, you can't see us. Because we've got a sport that when you turn on the TV, you open the newspaper, it's everywhere. We've got the sport that's the easiest to play. It's the one that is the sexiest up there and the coolest down there. So we have pure gold. We, and because we're the FAW, we've got a monopoly on football in the country because we're the governing body. So for me, it's kind of like it's nice when people say you're doing well, but we've an awful long way to go. And in the women's game, it's like, as I said earlier, every pound we put into it, every change we make that's positive, we instantly see results. It's like, it's like a home run, this thing. So we need to put more resources into it. We need to put more people at it. Will we play against England in the principality? I'd say very unlikely for lots of reasons, um, because it's not our home, first of all. Um, and the fans like going to Cardiff City Stadium, to be honest with you. Um, and I think it would take a lot for us to not play in Cardiff City Stadium or Wrexham when it's built. I was delighted to see the planning permission yesterday. That's more us. And it's important that we don't stray away from our brand, for want of a better word. When we will play there, though, is the opening match, hopefully, of your 28, uh, when we have to play there, because it's the only stadium we've put forward, because to win the bid. And hopefully that we have Garrett still playing in 2028, uh, kicking off, well, I can see it over there, uh, you know, with a full house um, against it. Could the women's team fill Cardiff City Stadium in the next campaign? I think. Oh, I'm, I'm watching the webinar. Can I, can I give a show back in 10? You can, yeah, no problem. Um, right. so what, you, what, you could, what you could see, actually, I think the next step for us, I was saying to Gemma recently, is that what you could see is when we go for the Euro 25, which I'm convinced we'll qualify for, hopefully with the right draw, but Gemma and the team will qualify for Euro 25. If, with the wind at our backs, I think we'll get there. But if we play a match on a Tuesday night in Cardiff City Stadium to qualify for Euro 25, I'm convinced we'll fill the stadium in the next, and that would be a huge step again. I mean, Lars, but I believe, you know, we keep looking at each other going, God, that's another step. That's another step. It feels like every time we look at each other, there's another step. So it's an, it's an, you can't stop this thing. It's just the train has gone and we're just trying to get on us to make sure that we can fill our stadiums like everybody else will. Thanks, Noel. I think we've got time for one more question. Is there a woman who'd like to ask a question? I'm conscious all the males have so far asked. Is there anyone here who's got a question? Yeah, somebody at the back, I can see a hand up. Hi, I'm Suma and I'm doing MBA with Artificial Intelligence. 
Um, I'm sorry, I was a little late and missed the conversation around digital transformation. Um, I have a question related to that. Like, has the uh, a football industry, or if I want to be a, a pretty more specific football association of Wales, identify um, the ways of using this digital transformation technology to detect the future talent? If yes, then how you guys are doing it? And is it really helping you out? If no, then do you have a future plans of using it to detect the future talent? Yeah. Well, it's a very good question. In terms of technology for finding talent, there are systems available like Scout7 and other ones that are used widely and extensively to look at players that we're looking at. We can get clips of all sorts of things. We can do analysis of Iran, for example, going into the matches. We can do all sorts of analysis with our players, where they're playing at their clubs. It's great. That part is great. And I hope that we're a leader in that area. I know that our technical analysis group, because of the great work of universities around the city, actually, uh, we've got technical analysts are easy for us to get. We also learn, I mean, if you look at the WRU, for example, rugby itself is fantastic at its technical analysis. I mean, I think it won't be long before you see a player running along with a laptop uh, at their own analysis because it's becoming just what you do. Our own players, I see Garrett now is wearing this thing around his arm, Wooze or wheeze or something it's called, which tells you if you haven't drank enough water, if you haven't slept enough, you know, if you need to stretch your hamstring, it tells you basically. It's just unbelievable what the players are using nowadays. And at the FAW, we have to be ahead of the curve because if we're not, I can promise you the players will tell us very quickly if we're not doing what we should be doing. Uh, they're, 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 um, this country comes from a trade union background. There's definitely characteristics of the players that are very much from that. If they don't but feel the women are worse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they don't feel they're getting, but it's great. I mean, it's great. That's how we improve. And that's, that's how we learn. It's a fantastic dialogue, I would say. Okay, what you said is really interesting because I mentioned earlier about us being a world leader. Now, I, I'm not a technophobe, so I'm not really into using technology, but I read it all the time. So I was watching programs over the last week about um, the metaverse, for example. Now, I'm 45, so I mentioned the junior council. We were talking about this on Sunday with them. The metaverse, living as an avatar in a digital world, what does that look like? Because I haven't a clue. But we would be pretty stupid if the likes of a Mark Zuckerberg decides to invest loads of money in that and for us not to watch these macro trends and try to go in on the back of them. Now, we have very good people. Nick is sitting in front of you here from our marketing team, very clever people who I think can see these trends and we'll bring in more digital people, that's for sure, to look at these macro trends to make sure the FAW is at the front of it, not behind it. So artificial intelligence definitely um, is an area that I see more and more. When I talk to our technical analysis, I hear more it used. If you're to ask about the detail of it, I might be a bit sketchy in that, but what I do know is, as I said earlier, we bring in really clever people, technologists, um, one of the things I think we should do, we did at UEFA quite a lot, was bring in futurologists mm. to talk about where this society is going here, particularly globally and more locally, because our strategy is actually a global, local Wales. Um, and if the futurologists can tell us how society is moving, all of our activities, never mind just our player acquisition, our player retention, all of our activities will get a lot better. Conscious that we're running out of time, um, we haven't covered a whole host of topics, but the level of interest in what Noel's saying is really considerable, as you can see. J just to finish off, a word on Qatar, and I think both Noel and I can speak for, I think, everybody in, in Welsh football, just to say that we all understand the issues relating to Qatar, the ethics, the principles, the compromises, and how conflicted we all feel about being in a state with a regime such as Qatar's. But one thing we will say, those of us who are going there to work, Noel has got a multi multiple roles whilst he's there, and I'm going to be working with Welsh Government and with Noel and the team, but we won't compromise on the values that Cymru has in anything we, we say or do, and we'll be using every opportunity to show that the values around personal identity, around workers' rights, um, around women's rights, LGBT rights, and so on, will be articulated by, by us. You know, we've got lots of us who live those values and believe in our own identities in those um, communities as well. So whilst we feel compromised and conflicted by aspects of Qatar, the talk about boycotts and so on is missing a really fundamental point about what we're trying to achieve, not just for football there, and not just actually for Cymru when we come home, but for the bigger football conversation. So please support us on that, because we know there will be things thrown at us during the course of the tournament. But we will be there for two reasons, no one will we, to get as much success for Rob and Gareth on the pitch, to cascade that back to Welsh football, but also to sell Wales to the world. Because 
the biggest problem Wales has at the moment is people don't know about us. The ignorance about Wales is our most <coughs> fundamental problem. Before we start selling Wales, we've got to make sure people know where Wales is. And the reality is being in the same group as England plays brilliantly for us on that because we are not England and we will be playing against England and our flag will be shown and our anthem and our colours and everything else. So stick with us because we'll have a lot of stick on social media. Believe me, I'm gearing up for that. Noah will gear up for that. But stick with us because the benefits of us being there will be much greater than the risks and the problems and the difficulties. So I think, Noah, you've been fantastic. You've, you've exposed a lot of the world of football and the FAW that um, helps, I think, people understand what our big ambitions are for, for the game. And we know that the, the association is in safe hands and football is in safe hands. And I think everybody here would wish you a massive good luck to Rob and the team, but also to the infrastructure around the team in Qatar. Laura, Noel, just a really big thank you from all of us here at Cardiff Business School for being with us this morning, for synchronising your diaries to be able to fit this slot in. Uh, I'd just like to echo what Laura has just said. Please pass on our very best wishes to all of the uh, the team and the, the players and the management team. Um, on behalf of us all, thank you for joining us this morning. Really grateful that we've had such a great crowd in here this morning. Diolch yn fawr i Anna, mae'ch Borama. Gobeithio'n fawr fyddwn eich gweld chi eto cyn bo hir.